Let's move on to our next uh, speaker, and that is Frank Dempsey, and he's uh, here with us uh, this evening. And he'll uh, talk to us about uh, uh, further developments of an Alcazimut mount uh, that uh, he's been working on for some time. And uh, we'll give him a moment to uh, get set up. <clears throat> I guess we're set to go. So I guess uh, the idea is to getting avoid getting too close to the mic to cause feedback, and we'll see what we can do here. So I guess right or wrong should do it. Okay. Well, I'll just get uh, close to the events uh, side events button here. So um, title says it all. So um, it's possible that some of you may remember this, the talks I did the past several years, and I tried to do it by internet by Zoom. And, Quite a nuisance with rural internet kept uh, losing signal and so on. So, but no more of that. But have the opportunity to do it here live. So, um, I asked Paul if it would be uh, might be in, in interest to do an update on it. So it is. Uh, this is the update. So, um, a little bit of further development I've done in the past few months, um, especially as summer has is, is moved into winter. Um, I think that picture is a thorough picture, a thorough image of it all. And for you in the room, that's uh, sitting on the table there. In case any of you want to have a look at it later. So I thought I'd do um, a few seconds of background in case you didn't catch the earlier um, talks I did about it. But why did I do this? And so the original idea was to um, see if um, I could uh, uh, build this uh, merry-go-round observatory that was built first by Leslie Peltier, who was a fairly famous comet, hunt comet hunter and variable star observer about half a century ago, when visual observing was uh, fairly common. And so this appeared on a forum on one of the astronomy uh, sites just a question, has anybody built one? So I thought, hey, neat idea, that's a fun project to do. So I started to do that. So I looked into it a little bit more, and here's a few details about it. I'll just point out a few details of relevance. The hut or shack rotates on um, on a track of steel on the ground, and that's why it's called a merry-go-round, because it was probably, probably you know, half a century ago, a child's merry-go-round was maybe a common thing in, say, a Sears catalog, maybe, and I don't know, so maybe, you know, scrap steel was around, and um, he, he got a hold of one and built an observatory on it. So he called it the merry-go-round observatory. Um, the other few details here are it's an enclosed hut where he has a little table and desk where he can put his charts and log books and so on. And it's an altazimuth mount, so his telescope is um, pointing out through a slot in the roof. Otherwise, he's sitting comfortably inside his little hut where it can rotate. And uh, the uh, telescope uh, moving in, uh, in an altitude and the hut moving in azimuth makes it an altazimuth mount. So a few little details there, and that's why I, I set off on a um, path of more or less copying that. So here's my version uh, without the hut. So I started to do this. I got a rotating platform on caster wheels, which you can't see here. But um, the main details are the um, um, mount. So you can barely see the mount uh, in that A-frame, which would be one of the walls of the finished hut when it were finished. Um, little telescope is there is a, is a four-inch reflector that I made a few years ago. but the main point there is it's an old, fairly old-fashioned uh, altazimuth. Uh, actually, I think it's an equatorial mount that I converted to an uh, altazimuth mount. The point is it's um, a mount that you might have saw, seen on um, a commercially made telescope uh, decades ago. Maybe it's still available. I don't know. But I got a hold of one. So that was my first guess. Use that to make some altazimuth motions. I thought it's a little wobbly. And as they were known to be, uh, you may actually have one of these mounts. And um, fine. Uh, it's good for scrap metal. but it's good for a fairly light, light duty telescope as well. Otherwise, the main point here is um, the, the platform rotates on the ground and there's some movement for the telescope to move on. Um, so um, I thought a better idea is um, a Dob, Dob style base. And so that's what I've pictured here. So you see a cradle um, with, uh, it's actually a three point Dob where um, a cradle would sit into that, uh, into the uh, base and it would rotate. Uh, same thing on the side of the hut on the A-frame. So I thought, um, Fine, that seems to work, and um, this is the version I ended up with. So here's where I finished off with the last presentation I did, maybe last summer. So 
big pair of binoculars. That's what I wanted to to mount uh, or to put to use. Um, it's sitting on this um, um, knob base sort of mount, which sits on top of um, any old uh, tripod. And you see in the lower right, it's fine for sitting position where I don't have to be too high. These particular binoculars have a 45 degree um, eyepiece and interchangeable eyepieces, so it's not a fixed magnification. Um, so that's where it was um, last summer. And so um, I started off mounting a telescope and I thought to mount these heavy uh, 100 millimeter binoculars would be far more far more uh, useful. So I've built it to fit those binoculars. So that's where I finished off and so I did a little bit further development uh, after that. And so um, I thought first of all I should point out what it doesn't do so we, we understand what we're talking about here. So it's not a super high magnification planetary telescope like you might see on the left there. It's not a really fancy automatic image, imaging rig like you see in um, modern day um, E-scope Equinox costs many thousands of dollars, um, operates at the press of a button. It's not one of them. It's not a super heavy duty aperture, uh, 12 and a half inch uh, reflector like you see in the lower left. And it's not a um, photoelectric photometry and spectroscopy rig um, you see in the lower right with um, gadgets and wires all over the place. It's not to do all that. It's not that at all. It's for visual observing only. And so um, here's the first modification I made. Um, I attached um, a good finder scope onto the, um, the base, so I actually have different telescopes that can mount onto it. The telescope you see here on the table is not the binoculars, of course, um, but it's one of several different telescopes I put onto that base. And so the first thing it needed was a good finder that sits on the base, so that the telescope that fits into it doesn't actually need um, doesn't actually um, need a finder for itself. But um, a right angle correct image finder scope I decided uh, several years ago was the ideal proper finder scope to have on the telescope. And so um, they don't normally come with telescopes because they cost several hundred dollars. And a, a telescope that comes with uh, most uh, telescopes, the finder scope that comes with it, is normally not a right angle, right angle correct image finder scope. It's a it's an inverted image. And so in my, in my opinion, for visual observing using charts, it's, it's very difficult to use. It's useless. It's worth the extra expense to find um, a right angle correct image um, scope. For a finder scope. So I decided that a few years ago. I've got numerous telescopes, so I started hoarding these whenever I saw them on sale. So I've got um, a few of them, but I, I decided on this particular little base, I only need one. So that was one uh, modification I made. Um, so um, the you, you, I didn't point it out here, but the, um, the base rotates on two uh, thick sheets of plastic that I found, and I made the whole thing out of scrap. So it's a lot of scrap and um, if you ask where to buy it, I say you don't need to because there's so much plastic garbage and waste all over the place. You don't need to look very hard to find uh, two sheets of plastic that will rotate one on the other with without much friction. But um, that's the way it was. Had you see in the um, left-hand image, um, the, it was uh, one of those sheets of plastic. The other is on the, the base sitting on top of the tripod. Um, so that was fine in the summertime, but in wintertime, um, it started to get cold and it had a little bit of bit more friction than I wanted it to have. So I thought, is there anything I can put on to reduce the friction? And yes, so I, I found, you know, I had some CDs, old CDs. I was ready to throw out a box and I thought, hmm, these slide over each other pretty nicely. So I wonder if I can make them put, uh, put them to use. And yes, I dropped them onto the basin between the two sheets of plastic. It's fairly easy to cut in half with a uh, good 10 snips. And so here in the image, you can see, um, I've, I've, I've Attached them with silicone sealant onto the, um, the base and the top plate slides over it really well. So it's quite frictionless in the cold weather that we have. So, um, if it, if it persists into the summer, I think that'll be the permanent solution. So, um, that was one thing. It also reduces what I call stiction, where stiction is, um, where it sticks together when you want to move it, um, in, a, in some dob scopes, for instance, um, you want them to move and they move freely, but if you actually get them to start moving, there's a little bit of, um, sticking motion. So, uh, it's a bit of a nuisance when you want to move your scope just a tiny little bit and you have to bump it past that stiction point. So I find that the CDs reduce stiction to quite a tiny amount. So this is pretty uh, a pretty good um, solution, in my opinion. Looks like a mess, but it works really well. Um, another U band controller uh, added on. Um, you don't need to ask, uh, or it could be a quiz. Um, didn't know I was going to test it, did you? But if you don't, if you have a telescope or a binocular with um, um, a lens or a glass element on the front, um, how long will it last before it gets dewed up? 
And he gets this. It doesn't matter because it's not very long. So you have to do something about it. You have to, uh, you can't really operate for very long, you know, more than half an hour in most cases, unless you have a night where you have, um, a cool, dry northeast wind blowing. Um, most of the time they'll have dew within an hour in most cases. And so, um, to have a dew controller fastened onto it, not dangling off the side, not hanging around with wires that get, um, you get uh, the trip over and so on, but um, Jack's actually built it onto the base and it's sitting under now. It's just tucked out of the way and there is room for it on the base underneath the telescope. So it fits really well. So that was one, another important solution to actually build it in. And so I'll drag the whole thing out, um, just pop it down and it's ready to go. I'm ready to plug in if I need to plug it in. So those are a few little uh, developments that I made on it. And that was um, most of what I wanted to illustrate. Um, so it's current use, the main intended use, uh, after I decided that, um, these binoculars would be more useful mounting on this rather than a telescope as in the original intention with, um, the merry-go-round observatory. Um, fairly big binoculars. I didn't bring them here because it's fairly heavy, <coughs> fairly heavy. Um, sometimes people, um, mount big binoculars on top of a tripod. Um, I think I had a slide in here somewhere of that. Um, the point here is, um, binoculars fit into that base, base, I, I made the base to hold the binoculars to be wide enough to hold those binoculars. Does a really good job. Um, there's no vibration, um, no shaking, um, but uh, the tripod solution did wasn't really uh, okay for this uh, size of binoculars. And I used to have um, Celestron 25 by 100 millimeter binoculars as well, which are nearly as heavy. I don't know if anybody here has them, but they're more common really. But I found these ones uh, an old. Um, um, Garrett uh, model of binocular, as I mentioned, they have 45 degree eyepieces and removable interchangeable eyepieces, so they're quite um, quite an upgrade in my opinion. But the base holds those binoculars really well, so I really built the base around those binoculars. And most the, the few telescopes I put in are smaller, so I'll try to illustrate them. Um, this is one. Uh, which one is this? Uh, this? This is the 80 millimeter telescope you see right on the table here, so it fits in pretty well. Um, I, I may not have pointed out that they um, mount with um, a Vixen dovetail. So a Vixen dovetail bar is mounted on the bottom of the binoculars and telescopes that I have here. And a Vixen dovetail base is sitting in the, in the base there. If you really want to look at it closely, I can show you. But it's, it's really easy to interchange the telescopes or binoculars on this mount. Uh, this is a 100 millimeter uh, Maxitov, a very ancient Mead uh, telescope. Um, does a really nice job of um, giving really sharp images, really wide field of view. Uh, it's low, low magnification. Um, so once again, with this and the other telescopes I'm illustrating, the mount moves really well. Um, it keeps the uh, stars in, in the field of view. You can bump it along just slowly. And uh, as, I mentioned, as I mentioned, friction is reduced small enough that I can move it really quite smoothly just by hand when I want to. So um, that's the um, 100 millimeter um, mead. Um, this is a 114 millimeter longer telescope. Um, has a piece of glass on the front, which needs new protection as well, as I mentioned. Um, but again, it's small enough to fit inside the cradle. And you may see here its dovetail plate is a bit more visible just because of the way I have the photograph taken there. So um, I think that's that. Uh, I, I, I tested it by putting on this um, six inch, or actually 152 millimeter Maxitov. I think it's a MacCast telescope. Any of you that have gone to the um, Pickering uh, Lake Lakeshore uh, public outreach events may have seen this. I had it in the past uh, events, past couple of events that we did in autumn of, of last year. Um, it's a phenomenal planetary telescope. It's capable of magnifications of around three to four hundred power. Um, but I didn't do that. I, I thought it's a little heavy and a little overwhelming this little amount, but it's not. I'm amazed that it does quite a good job holding it that heavy of a telescope. It may actually be heavier than those heavy binoculars that are sold. Anyway, uh, just one of its um, the scopes that I find I could use with this mount. Although I, I think the smaller scopes I showed you earlier are more are more likely to be used on a um, portable basis. Um, so um, I'm, uh, uh, one one little detail is how I'm using it. And so the point here is with star charts. So the illustration shows some star charts that I use. So you may or may not be familiar with the Star Sky Atlas 2000. Um, that's what I have there, and Uranometria um, is also um, a fairly uh, well-known in past years atlas because a lot of people don't use atlases or star charts anymore. Um, I do, and so that one there I put into a three-ring binder so I can take the sheets out, but I use them all the time, and so that's how I'm 
that's observing that I do. So definitely you don't need a keypad. Keypad, there's no use here. It's totally movable by, movable by hand and um, totally re required to recognize the stars and constellations and navigate that way to the target. So that's how this telescope works. And that's why I pointed out it's not for um, other uh, super imaging or, or photometry or planetary things that require really high magnification. These are um, generally low power, wide field telescopes that um, allow me to easily find my target. So what are my targets? I think I put in a picture here somewhere. Um, yeah, here, here are my targets. So you may uh, recognize the um, pages. They may be a little blurry from RESC handbook. Um, one page is for dark nebulae. And dark, dark nebulas are uh, one thing that I'll do from really dark sky locations with a really wide field of view. And that's where those big binoculars will come in uh, pretty useful. Um, but any of these little small wide field telescopes will also do a good job, I think. Um, Lower left shows a page from double and multiple stars, and I do. I've just start, started doing quite a lot of double star observing, and these small telescopes do a really good job of it, even without tracking and requiring manual uh, navigation to the to the target. Um, carbon stars. So the Astronomical League has an interesting program for for carbon stars, and so I've observed them. So one of my log sheets is up there on the right. There's also a page or, or a good list in the Observer's Handbook for carbon stars. Mostly similar stars to what are on the Astronomical League's uh, list of carbon stars. Anyway, uh, variable stars is the other thing that I do quite a lot of, and um, it's also fun to find those stars manually by, by charts and um, by star hopping. So those are what I plan to use it for. I think that's the uh, end of the presentation. So any questions or comments? Um, you might find your answer if you have a look at this uh, set up on the table. Otherwise, any questions, I'll be glad to answer any questions. So, <laughs> for uh, sharing uh, your amount uh, with us. Okay, uh, and uh, we'll certainly have a look at it after the meeting. Um, let's go to any questions. Uh, um, can you guys hear me? Yes, okay. Uh, no, we didn't get any questions from you, too. Okay. And in the room, we have Ed here with a question. Come on up. Hi, Frank. I'm um, just noticing that you had various di like diameters of telescopes in there. And obviously, it pivots on that pivot with the altitude. But do the different diameters kind of affect where the balance is, and it might want to flop upwards or flop downwards? Yes, it's a good question about the balance. The short answer to your question is no, it doesn't seem to affect it because the um, uh, dovetail bars um, uh, fitting in a dovetail base have um, a few inches or a good few centimeters or more of, of travel. So um, they're really easy to balance. So I've been shocked by how well they balance because I originally intended to put in uh, a bar with a counterweight to assist in balancing it. But um, I've been surprised at how easily I can find balance on these scopes, even when I change eyepieces from lighter to heavier or, or whatever. But the um, dovetail arrangement allows me to um, allow allows a you know several inches or a good five centimeters of up and down motion that allows me to easily find balance. And so I've been shocked at how well balanced um, each of those little scopes is. So it hasn't been a problem with either the lighter scopes or the heavier scopes and binoculars. Um, as well as balance, um, a further note is the uh, stability of the whole thing. The whole thing is vastly more stable than the small um, mount, um, old equatorial mount that might have showed uh, earlier in the back in, in the earlier version. Um, I think it's because of um, fairly wide um, wide base um, b between the pivots, um, and it's also fairly low, pretty low to the tripod, and it's just you know three quarter plywood, so that's fairly sturdy too. So. Um, as well as balance, its stability is amazing. So I'm really thoroughly impressed that uh, what a nice job it did. Okay, thank you. We have one more question coming up. That's a, that's a really cool hack. Thank you, the, the way you, you built that. I'm uh, just curious about the finder scope. I, the, when you're switching out telescopes, uh, I guess if you're doing wide, wide field, aligning the finder scope, probably not critical, but if it were critical, how how tough a job is aligning the, the main scope and the finder scope? Um, it's easy. Um, it's easier to illustrate. 
with the one I brought on the table, I didn't actually bring pack the little bracket which detaches. So here's a good picture right here. Um, so the point here is, um, in case I didn't make it clear, that bracket with the finder scope stays with the mount. So it stays there, and once I've got it aligned, um, it's only held on by two bolts, but but it's once I've got it aligned, it stays aligned for all the telescopes, or it's close enough for all the telescopes. So I start off with a. Uh, it's also worthwhile to mention each of these telescopes um, at low power. It's a very wide field of view, a good three degrees approximately, generally speaking, a good three degrees of field of view, so that it's really easy to line up the finder scope in my light blue to sky on um, any star and um, and then use the telescope itself as a finder for the rest of my star hopping because it's such a wide field of view. So, but to answer your question, um, once I've got it set up and aligned, it's aligned for all the telescopes because they all line up in the same dovetail base. So dovetail um, base, the dovetail bar in this dovetail base causes it to be lined up all the time. Uh, every telescope and every blocker just lines up perfectly. So uh, once the finder is set up, it's um, it's done. Frank, I have a question myself. Um, what material did you use for the altitude bearing? Um, it's um, uh, it's um, is the word PVC? Um, where basically the short answer is pl plastic plumbing pipe. And so the um, approximately, uh, you see the one on the left in this picture, it's approximately three inch diameter, or very roughly plumbing pipe. And then I use a slightly larger pipe for the other, uh, for the, for the um, bases in which it rests. And so you can see a better picture right here at the very, very extreme lower left. There's two little pads um, made from a slightly larger diameter pipe. And that just meant cutting a piece of pipe, you know, cut about two centimeters long, um, and cutting off a tiny section of it. Just because its radius of curvature is slightly larger than that pipe, you see that pipe. It's there. It's maybe um, one inch or a couple of centimeters wide, and just I just cut a plywood disc to fit inside it. And so, um, short answer: plastic pipe. Uh, any more questions in the room? Okay. Good. Thank you very much again. Thank you.